and it is three o'clock and I'd like to welcome everybody to today's uh, panel. I hope that everybody's been having a great day listening to all of these wonderful panel discussions at the New York City Real Estate Expo. Uh, we will be talking about how the pandemic has shifted trends as to where the global citizen is deploying their capital. And what is really great about this is that this will last for about an hour. There will be no opportunity for Q&A during the panel, but afterwards you'll have the opportunity to interact with the panelists directly via the information will come via email. So by way of introduction, I am Nikki Beauchamp. I am a global real estate advisor here with Engel & Volkers based in New York City. Engel & Volkers was formed in Hamburg, Germany in 1977, and our offices span six continents and over 30 countries uh, in residential, commercial, yacht, and aviation brokerage. And I'm so happy to be here with my dear friend, Ellie Johnson, who is the president of Berkshire Hathaway Home Services in New York. Relationships are everything in business, especially in real estate and especially in international real estate. So collaboration is key. So welcome, Ellie. So happy to be here with you. Thank you, Nikki. That was a lovely introduction and i um, grateful to be with everyone today. And we, um, Berkshire Hathaway Home Services, New York Properties, we've been in New York since uh, January of 2017. So we are entering into a fifth year. However, the company um, it dates back to uh, 1998 with home services. And in 2013, home, Berkshire Hathaway Inc., um, granted us the privilege to adapt the Berkshire Hathaway name to that name. So I know it is a wonderful mouthful because um, I, I couldn't be more excited to be part of the Berkshire Hathaway Home Services brand. And today I'm excited to be in this panel because we have Aman uh, Samra, who is a client of Berkshire Hathaway Home Services in our offices in London. So he will speak from the perspective of a client of a global real estate company and Dunia Fadi, who is the chief operating officer for our golf properties in Dubai. So she is in charge of all of the growth and development of the company and works directly uh, and with the CEO of, and, and founder of the uh, offices in Dubai. And since we opened New York, we have um, maintained a rapid expansion growth in the global footprint. And we have, even through the pandemic, we opened offices in um, Canada and in Mexico. And uh, we have offices in London and uh, in Germany, in Portugal, expanding into other markets, um, such as we have offices in Spain. And, uh, you know, it, it's been an amazing, an amazing journey to be part of this organization. We have north of 50,000 agents globally, um, and we are the number one um, company globally in um, sales transactions. Uh, throughout the uh, country um, for through real trends. But um, I would like to start with perhaps Eman to introduce yourself and tell a little bit from the, uh, again, I, I have questions for you, but I'd like to do the introduction and ask you some questions and then move it over to Dunia. Absolutely, yeah. So just uh, thank you for the introduction. It's uh, my name is Aman Samra. I'm the design director for Manhattan Properties. We are an international property development firm um, headquartered out of London, but we've been operating in the US uh, primarily along the East Coast for the last 10 years or so. Um, we've done we've primarily focused on residential developments. And actually our relationship with Berkshire Hathaway came via a referral in London, and then it went over to the US and now we, our properties in the US are now being listed with yourselves. Um, so far, you know, our relationship's been great. I couldn't be happier with everything that's been going on with ourselves. Thank you. Um, so, um, Aman, you know, we're talking about uh, global wealth and trends. And one of the questions that I would like to ask you, can you share with the audience the profile of a typical billionaire client of yours? Sure. I mean, they come few and far between, but, you know, on the odd occasion, there have been appropriate uh, projects where we have interacted with, uh, with, with a few. Um, 
And I think the perception is that m many assume that if somebody has achieved this kind of st status or success in their life, that they're suddenly going to be a completely different person. Um, but, you know, in the interactions that we've had, you know, people of, you know, of, you know, of great success are surprisingly very humble. Um, and, you know, they're no different to you, you and I. And, you know, irrespective of, of their wealth, you'll be, you know, it, it may come as a surprise, but, you know, people are still very shrewd with their money. And I, and I guess that's part and parcel of how they achieved it in the first place as well. So, you know, when it comes to a purchase or a sale of a property, they're still looking for value for their money. They're still looking for a good investment. Um, and, you know, it's, it's very much a, a case of Treat, treating treating the person with respect, but you know, not you know, but still treating them as you and I, uh, as you would as you would treat anybody else. Correct, and you know that's one of the things that Berkshire Hathaway Home Services prides themselves on, in the humility and um, you know that that kindness that comes with the way that you know we service all price points and we deal with billionaires as well as entry level uh, real estate. Um, individuals and everybody's treated with the same level and I know that Nikki and her company uh, perform in the same fashion as well. So um, I would like to uh, introduce Dunia and then kind of play off the questions so that you know everybody gets an opportunity. So Dunia would you like to um, tell a little bit about yourself and how you became part of the family? Hi, Ellie. Thank you uh, for the lovely uh, introduction. Uh, hi, Nikki. Hi, Aman. Hi, everyone. So uh, my name is Dunya Fadi. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of the Berkshire Hathaway Home Services Gulf Properties here in Dubai. I have been part of the real estate market uh, for the past 16 years, and I have uh, uh, become part of the fam Berkshire Hathaway uh, Home Services family since uh, July 2019. Uh, since they embarked on this journey journey in the Middle East. It has been very excited, just like you said, Ellie, it's uh, such an honor to be part of this network. It's such an honor to do business with everyone uh, in the industry on a global scale. Um, so it is, uh, I'm still discovering as we go, but it has so far been a very exciting and, uh, and superb start, if I may say. That's great. So, Juni, a question for you. Where are you seeing the highest concentration of wealth um, by region? And are there any trends or shifts that you are witnessing from your part of the world? Sure. So, if, it, as I mean, for the past decades, um, many decades now, the concentration of wealth, or as uh, the reports say, 30% of the wealth is. Uh, belongs to you guys. I want some of it. You can send us some here to the Middle East. So yes, 30% of the world's wealth is uh, parked uh, in the US. Of course, comes after that Europe. You have also um, a big portion of that. Uh, the Asian countries combined also represent uh, quite a portion of the global wealth. Uh, however, like you said, there are new trends and there are new shifts not only due to uh, the latest uh, economic movement, but also due to the pandemic. Um, and if you, if I may say, the 2020 has been the year of the two halves, right? So the first half where the part of the wealth was wiped, and then the second half where things were caught up and uh, wealth was recovered, if, um, if that's the right word. So um, we are seeing, in fact, this morning I was uh, reading and the article shared that uh, the latest uh, or the 2021 uh, list of the richest people in the world, uh, we have, and I am proud to say, 11 out of those uh, uh, people or the richest people in the world are residents of the UAE. Uh, part are locals, Emiratis, and part are, they come from Russia, from India, from Europe. So, and we are also expecting as part of them, uh, some of the studies that has been shared lately and uh, following the trend that we've been seeing uh, recently for since Q4, I, would, I may say 2020, we're seeing a lot of wealth being um, or coming or is being parked here in the UAE because as you may hear, the government has been very dynamic, very proactive. Um, opening up a lot of laws and regulations, the visas, the retirement schemes, um, the work from home uh, 
visa as well that you could be um, staying in the UAE but working for you know uh, in uh, distance with your company wherever you are in Europe or US or Asia so all these opportunities have opened up uh, a level of confidence in the investors and they have uh, definitely uh, are or are looking at Dubai differently uh, recently so we are receiving more and more of that wealth great now Juni I know you did a um a joint presentation with our uh, Berkshire Hathaway Home Services offices in, for Georgia properties in Atlanta. Yes. And that was very driven to what you're speaking of with regards to government um, programs and whatnot. Do you wanna share a little bit on that experience? Because I thought you guys put an amazing uh, event in, in Georgia. Yes, Ellie, thank you. Uh, yes, in fact, it was just at the start of the pandemic when we did this event. Um, in uh, specifically in Atlanta, and it was uh, called de demystifying Dubai because you know, uh, as great of a city as Dubai, still it is part of the Middle East, which receives a huge, uh, <laughs> um, you know, people think that the Middle East or Dubai is uh, same like places like uh, Iraq or uh, other countries, but it's not. It's a beautiful cosmopolitan city, and I wanted to share. I have been living here for 16 years. I've got a family. Uh, my kids go to school here. I've been working here as a woman. So I really wanted to share that experience with, uh, with the world um, and especially with our uh, network in the US and their clients. So it has been very well received. Um, a lot of amount of data and uh, information has been shared and we plan on doing more. And unfortunately due to COVID we had to uh, mm -hmm. uh, put it now on hold, but we would be doing more and we would be doing the same in New York and uh, Los Angeles and San Francisco and Texas. So there is more to come in that space. Great, Nikki, do you have any questions for our panel? Or do you wanna share from what you heard a little bit from the standpoint of your company? I mean, what's really interesting is that when you look at the impact of the work from home environment, and now that people can choose to live anywhere, where are they deciding to go? Are they going to more second home markets and moving away from some of our urban markets because now they don't need to be here all the time. So it's very interesting. I have clients who have been going to California, they're going to Salt Lake. Eventually when we can travel freely to Europe, they're thinking, maybe they'll retire now and go live in Spain half the year or Portugal and even Dubai. I mean, I, I think that's an amazing opportunity that you could work in your American company, but live in Dubai and experience that. That's right. So Aman, a question for you. What are you seeing in terms of appetite for risk for the millennials? Um, well, hopefully I can give you some first-hand uh, knowledge being a millennial myself. So, uh, <laughs> exactly. Um, I mean, I, I feel like perhaps, you know, the, the pandemic has triggered a change in, in mindset. It has altered perceptions. Um, I think prior to the pandemic, it was very much a, a renter's mindset. You know, it, people weren't thinking about long-term investment so much. It was very much a live for the moment kind of mentality. And, you know, like I said, perhaps because of the pandemic or maybe just a general shift as we get older, or, you know, perhaps just idle minds thinking about the future. But I feel like now it's, it's becoming more of a situation where millennials are thinking about securing themselves more long term. And, you know, you, you surround yourself with people who clearly are looking, you know, for either personal homes or, or investments as well. Um, I feel like perhaps with this, with, with with everybody being stuck at home for such a long time, you know, people have been thinking about how they can generate additional incomes or passive incomes. You know, it's obvious to see just from things like the stock market that people are clearly trading a lot more, but you know, it's, it's not, that's just one form of investment. And the other form is, you know, another staple is obviously uh, property. And I've noticed that, you know, from, from a millennial's perspective, you know, the, the appetite for investment opportunities is there most definitely. Um, and I think it also goes hand in hand with the fact that technology plays such a big part in this as well. You know, be, to be able to search for property just from the from your phone, it's you know that's millennial culture. That is what, you know what, what the bread and butter of it is these days. Uh, so the, the accessibility and the ease of what you know how you're able to search for property, how you're able to transact transact that property, has just made it. Uh, I think I think it's just increased the appetite, and there has definitely been a shift towards acquisition rather than rentals. 
do you think from the perspective of the development projects that you built, I mean, obviously you keep in all these demographics in mind, what are some of the things that you think would be unique to that shifted for you guys as the market is shifting and the mindset of the millennial? And I agree with you. You know, I, I, I think that there is this mystique about you guys that is erroneous and is the fact that the way I see it from, uh, you know, I sit on a bigger perch, so I'm looking at a broader picture of consumers and the interaction through my sales team um, dealing with buyers and sellers. And I, I think that the, the foundation is there and the pandemic has sort of brought back those core values that they have or they grew up with because um, they were simply delaying the buying process to a later age, just like they were delaying starting a family perhaps. But the, the fundamental, um, you know, part of it was always there. And, and I think the pandemic accelerated that process for them. There, am I reading this I correctly? I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. That's exactly, exactly what I've been thinking as well. I mean, I think, like you said, the millennials just being willing to wait, they just wait a little bit longer than most, that's all. Uh, but the inevitable is that, you know, that phase was always going to come in and it clearly has been recently. In, in some ways, because everybody has been spending more time at home, they've really learned what they need in a residence, and that has shifted their priorities, and now that's influencing their choices. Absolutely. I think, you know, with, with, the, with the lesser distractions of everyday life, people are thinking about the fundamental things in, in life and, um, you know, property investment and buying a home and, you know, you know so securing your future in a long-term investment are all those kind of things that people are now focusing on far more so. Great. So, Junia, being a, a CFO, of course, I'm throwing the heavy duty questions to you. Um, disruption has not been limited only to, industry, to our industry. It has certainly changed the political landscape. How do you see this shift towards um, pro, um, you know, protection and affecting global growth? Uh, and are there areas that are more affected than others? Like for example, uh, for us currently in New York, uh, we are dealing with a new presidency in the White House that is impacting uh, the future of how our taxes are going to be processed. And Nikki and I can discuss a little bit on that, but I wanna hear it from your perspective on a more global. Um, sure. So when, when, we, when it comes to politics or protectionism, uh, they're really linked or a, a economy, economy's well-being, if I may say, uh, they're very, it can, politics can influence uh, the economy and uh, vice versa, if the economy is not doing well, so the political parties are getting um, affected as well. But what we are seeing for the last, um, uh, I think, couple of decades now, or a decade, just, uh, by to, uh, just after the recession, things have started turn, uh, changing, if, um, if that's the word, which with, in global trade, the global trade has reduced to what it used to be previously. Um, and to add to that, the protect, uh, pro, uh, protectionism has added uh, more, um, if I may, it is, unfortunately, uh, it has been reflecting negatively on the on the well-being of the economy of uh, multiple countries. Um, we see in emerging more emerging markets right now. We are seeing big economies trying to protect themselves as well, uh, uh, by localizing uh, all their production and industries, which is not necessarily helping, to be honest, because. Yes, the pandemic has showed that you know, you, you have to be self-sufficient because you know the uh, the trade got um, got affected the shipping the, everything got interrupted due to the pandemic but still because of the way the world runs right now the connectivity the way the 5g is is, is, is taking the world forward you can't really just uh, impose protectionism on the people and um, you have to really be open to the to what the rest of the world is doing and work together because if anything this pandemic has showed us is that we need to work together to go to get through it 
uh, whether we, us in business, uh, whether through families supporting each other, through, whether through countries support. So really the, 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 um, the effect of the pandemic on the global uh, uh, landscape is what we have done to this, uh, to this uh, earth, right? So it is only with our work, work uh, with us working together, we can make it um, go away. But by countries protecting or imposing protectionism right now, they are slowing the economy, uh, the recovery of their economies. Right. Uh, if, uh, and especially the most affected countries. And we've, we've seen new tariffs being imposed. We've seen new trade wars happening around us. And it's not helping, not, especially not during the pandemic when everyone needs to come together and uh, help one another. Right. So I hope um, that, um, uh, globalization remains uh, the forefront. Uh, of course, protecting everyone's uh, rights and country and everything, it's, it's very important, but I think working together as economies or as uh, governments is far more important than uh, right. and imposing I think such law right now. Thank you, Tuni, and, and the importance of all of this, and uh, Nikki, perhaps you can talk more locally from what's going on in our current market here in New York, and the impact, like you're saying, is um, every country has to protect and, and, and deliver. But if we're not working together and collaborating together, and it doesn't matter what industry you're in, you know, exactly. I, I think that we are a perfect example of that. We have Engels and Volker yeah. and Berkshire Hathaway Home Services collaborating together and, and sharing ideas because the truth is that the world, you know, what technology has done for the world, which was so it, it, needed was the transparency. It has brought us together, right? So it has you brought can't us together. now put us apart. It's very difficult to do that. Um, and one, um, one example, if I may give is, um, it's us in the Middle East, right? Um, like Saudi Arabia, for, for, for example, they have always been uh, um, out of touch with the rest of the world when it comes to within their country, you know, entertainment and, um, and leisure and all of that. But they couldn't, cut, the internet has already influenced people. And so the dynamic new government said, okay, I can see that people have this appetite. Let's, we need to open it up. And they started opening things up and now the economy is gonna flourish and uh, benefit from this for decades to come. Um, on the other hand, where protectionism is being imposed, you, the consumer is paying for it. You know, that extra cost of uh, producing goods uh, within um, for a short period, I mean, for maybe for the first two, three or five years, it is us, the consumer, who's gonna pay that cost because if it used to come from somewhere else cheaper, um, either the rich have to pay through taxes or the consumer has to pay through buying or paying for that uh, That's a margin great, that has been. Anyway, That's it's a great point. Um, Nikki, you want to touch a little bit on what's going on in our current world? You know, and in our current world, in addition to having a change in our national landscape, we also have a change that's coming in the very near future of our local landscape. And so additional taxes, and these things may delay someone who may have considered purchasing and they will look at things in a very different way. And they might say, well, maybe I need to hold off buying something in New York. I'll consider buying something in Dubai. I'll consider buying something in London first. And I think that knowing all of these factors and how they all connect is so key so that we can help our clients as we're advising them as to what makes the most sense for them. It has definitely increased the uncertainty and complexity of how things would be in the future. No one knows right now. So everyone is kind of on hold. Uh, Everyone's on hold. Everyone's on pause in a bit. So Aman, a question for you. What are you seeing in terms of shifts to original wealth? What are the factors driving this move? I mean, you know, we keep repeating ourselves when we keep referring to everything is regarding to the pandemic, but that is our current affair. So, you know, it's an unavoidable topic. But I mean, if you look at major city hubs, the reality is they will still outperform other areas of the, of, of the country or the cities or wherever, neighboring areas as it may be, whether it's in terms of productivity or human capital or wages, I mean, the main hubs will always remain the main hubs. That, um, but it's always been the age-old question of, you know, when you factor in housing costs, what does the, the household in, income become? Mm -hmm. And you know, when you factor in 
the cost of living in a large city, it does average out to becoming the same household income as somebody who may be living outside and maybe not earning that same amount. Now, so with the shift that's been occurring in London, I'm assuming in, in most of the major areas as well, people who have been living in the major city have, have been shifting out to the outer areas, which has actually helped their household income, which has been great. The question is whether that setup is a permanent one or a temporary one. Right. Um, I know for a fact that here in London, for example, the reality is, is that people are going to be coming back to the main cities. Uh, you know, offices are going to be demanding that their employees come back to the, to the workplace. Um, working from home was a great setup, but it's becoming more of a hybrid situation rather than a permanent situation. So how that reflects into our ways of living and where we live, it's inevitably going to have an effect. Right. And, you know, Aman, you bring out great points because London and New York City are very pal parallel in that fact. Mm -hmm. and, and we feel, uh, at least I can speak for the people that I interact with on my day to day um, business, that, um, you know, aside from reading the headlines of newspapers, which they need to sell newspapers, you know, this morning was a perfect example. Um, my husband likes to listen to the news on the radio very old fashioned uh, while he's eating his breakfast and, uh, and, and then simultaneously looking at the front page of the newspaper. And they could have not been farther apart. The radio is saying people are coming back to New York and we are seeing better results on the rental office building market versus and the headline of the newspaper was New York is going to disappear basically so you know go figure right and I think this is why it's so so important to be informed to speak to intelligent people like the people on this panel that can give a perspective not you know that somewhere in the news there's you shift through the truth but when we are dealing in this industry day to day you're developing business Nicole is in the trenches selling real estate and having her investor clients uh, believe in what she's proposing to them to get operating at a, a higher level uh, running the financials of an entire company and, and telling her CEO whether or not that's a good investment or not but ultimately, uh, you know, the, the beauty of uh, real estate is one of those uh, assets in class that um, every consumer needs, regardless of price point. We need a roof over our heads. Mm -hmm. uh, we need Don't to eat. Lie. We need to clothe ourselves. And those are the three industries that no matter what is happening in the world, uh, we need to be part of this society. Uh, so uh, the... For us in New York, uh, you know, we've been, uh, there is always a flux of what's going on globally, just like uh, London, and what's going on with our governments that we're looking at taxes that can uh, certainly impact uh, what happens to the values of our properties. But it's really not so much about an exodus or an influx of people, it's more about where are those prices going? Because again, the need for housing will always exist. People will come back to their offices. And I know people that are starting to travel for work that they are being mandated by their employers uh, to show up to their offices. Uh, so, you know, it's, I think this year is a year of um, growth and evolution, no matter where you are in the world because of the pandemic, where we are just learning to define a new norm and, and where that falls into our industry, it's really, there's only two categories. Mm -hmm. uh, it's either gonna be a buyer's market or a seller's market. And the values will shift from one place to the other. I have another question for you. Uh, uh, Aman, is what are your passion? Uh, what what do you, what are the passions of a high net worth uh, client uh, for you? I know you talk about yes, we are all the same. You know, my I'm always reminded. You know, we wake up every morning and we go to one side of the bed and put our feet on the ground. So no matter how much money you have or don't have, you have to do that to get out of bed. Uh, but having said that, uh, you know. Is there something 
uh, unique uh, or different about them or perhaps just how they go about their thought process? Um, it, well, talking about uh, previous projects that we've encountered, previous clients that we've had, um, our business model has been slightly different. We, we've never been a, a builder as such. We've always delivered a product that we feel is going to be suitable for the demographic that we're targeting. Uh, and therefore we've designed our projects accordingly you know, to, to hopefully be to tick all the boxes that will be required for that specific kind of, kind of client. Mm -hmm. um, in regards to you know, what we, that would encompass, you know, we, we've always ensured that there's been um, extensive uh, entertaining spaces, for example, that's always been a, a key factor for, for clients. Um, you know, when we're talking about a certain status of person, there's going to be their their, their little hobbies, let's say, and things like fine art, whether it be you know fine dining or whatever it may be, we, we try to accommodate for things like that. So you know when we're designing properties, we ensure that there's big expansive spaces to be able to accommodate you know art as it may be, or things like wine cellars or beautiful kitchens. Um, it's you know like I said, we, we as not being a builder ourselves, we're more you know delivering a product. I feel like we've managed to always find that nice balance where it's been able to accommodate most requests, and you know, it's it's maybe able to be it's work. It's a model that's worked for us. Right. Well, you bring out a really good point because uh, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal from our um, company's um, CEO and one of the, our ownership in Germany, for instance, and one of the questions was about, you know, how is the market doing in Germany? And one of the things that was that came up is that up until prior to the pandemic, there was an incredible demand for micro apartments and, and small units. And all of a sudden the consumer is going backwards and saying, no, 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 no. We want a lot of space. We want a lot of room for us to interact. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it was really uh, interesting to, to see how that completely has their market demand has completely shifted and um you know so but uh, just a reminder to the audience that we are not going to do q a during the panel however um you will uh your questions will be sent to us and we will be able to respond to you individually this is at the request of the New York Real Estate Expo. So I apologize. I saw a couple of questions on the chat room. I'm not ignoring you. You will get responded to. So Nikki, any other questions? I know we have an amazing series of questions that we can go We, on. we do. And I just wanted to expand on the upsizing that it stands to reason when you're spending your time in your residence, let's say 90% of the day, you learn how space works for you. And that's also what we're seeing here in New York City. We're seeing renters who are deciding they want more space. So they're trying to trade up to nicer apartments and that's driving the increase in rentals. The same thing with the sales. If I have been in a one bedroom or a two bedroom and now everybody is Zooming from home and learning remotely, you now also need more space. So I think it's very interesting and we'll see that continue for quite some time. Yes. Uh, now, this question is for either one of you. Um, where do you see opportunities in the marketplace, both in the US or abroad, from your perspective? Sure. I mean, I, mean, I don't mind speaking on, the, on that first, if you don't mind. Uh, I mean, surprisingly, you know, I think at, when, when, the, when the pandemic, when we're in, in the heart of the pandemic, everyone assumed that there was going to be opportunities everywhere. You know, people thought they were going to be struggling with work, you know, in the UK, for example, you know, people were either losing their jobs or there wasn't new opportunities and it was very a doom and gloom mentality. And then from our perspective as property developers, we thought it was going to be a biased market. So we thought, okay, great time for us to go shopping, see what opportunities we can get. Surprisingly, the market in London has held strong throughout. You know, there have been, the opportunities have been very, very few. Uh, prices have remained fairly constant. There's been no serious dips whatsoever. Um, it's held strong. It's held strong. Um, and we're still in lockdown at the moment. Uh, we, we should be out of lockdown in within the next couple of months, so by June. And you know, that's been more than a year or so. And 
that dip never occurred. So, uh, you know, the market here has been, it, it, it's, it's held its ground the whole way through. Uh, and hopefully when, when things do reopen to a full capacity once again, we hope that, you know, it continues to thrive and only go upwards from there on in. Right. You know, uh, Nikki, I, I would like to, to uh, go right after a man because you're in the trenches every day. And I love to hear your perspective from your company because I can share with you ours. But, um, you know, I think that uh, I like to, uh, with regards you know, to exactly that statement uh, of it's, the illusion of pricing and, and discounts and where is I mean, the it's, reality? <laughs> <laughs> it's the illusion of everybody's leaving New York City. There are 8 million people. 8 million people did not disappear overnight. The illusion that there are massive or that there were massive discounts because of the pandemic. Yes, we had a shutdown for about three months, almost exactly to the day. Yes, the pricing did shift down, but that also created opportunity for people to commit and to buy for the first time or to buy larger apartments. And what we're seeing now, we're seeing the after effects of everybody being cooped up and that sort of pent up demand that didn't happen last spring and early in the summer when we were still sort of inching our way out of lockdown. And it's just, it's gangbusters. We were joking earlier that it's a beautiful day in New York City. I haven't left my apartment. I woke up to negotiate a deal that I was negotiating when I fell asleep last night. Like that's the pace of the market that we're in. And it's just extraordinary. And colleagues that I'm talking to, we are all just experiencing that. And it's really remarkable where we are now compared to where we were yeah. this well, time you know, last year. We came from a 90% shutdown in our marketplace in New York City a year ago to, um, we ended up at about 23%. So, you know, it has moved forward in the right direction. And more importantly, what we're seeing, I mean, uh, you know, for New York, which is very small windows of opportunity, if you look historically at a buyer's market, you know, what is a buyer's market, we're seeing in, um, across Manhattan um, a five to 10% discount of the asking price of an asset. That is priced correctly, of course, and it doesn't matter whether it's a pandemic or financial crisis, if the asset is priced correctly. And, and we're starting to see more demand and uh, we're starting to see pockets in different price points that are being impacted, that you are getting multiple offers and you might not get over asked, but the, you, you are able to get to that asking price on the asset. But what about for you in the Middle East, Dunia? And I know you service a lot of European countries as well in the sense of the, you know, the commute and businesses between Europe and okay. Middle East. Um, I would share the same thoughts that uh, uh, Aman and Nikki have uh, shared on this platform because everyone thought, just like Aman said, the pandemic, oh, everyone panicked, uh, everyone said, okay, I'll sell now before the prices drop, or um, it's just we were we were in a standstill, and there, there, there was, luckily in Dubai, we only had three weeks uh, or four weeks of lockdown, and then afterwards, everything opened up uh, progressively and then it was okay with restrictions and everything but we we managed to keep the economy and the businesses uh, intact um going back to the real estate market so yes during i think two three months we had a panic some prices dropped there were a lot of people waiting for that opportunity so all those properties with lower prices have been picked up uh, and bought immediately mm -hmm. and then as soon as we opened up around june july by august September, we've seen the transactions going higher and higher and the demand going higher and higher. People moving from apartments to townhouses to villas. In fact, we have a huge shortage right now in, uh, in Dubai to what the buyers need versus what's available out there in the market. So everyone wanted beautiful penthouses. Everyone wanted villas with gardens. Um, everyone wanted ha to have a gym in the house and an office and a, and a place for the kids to study and a place to do a Zoom a business uh, meeting. So the demand was is always there. And in a matter of two to three months, prices jumped. Uh, the, the sellers refused to sell anymore. In fact, we had so many contracts come to almost closing and then the seller would change his mind and not want to sell anymore because either he wants a higher price or he just feels that his property's value is going up 
and he would like to hold on to it. Um, so yes, the demand has been uh, phenomenal so far, even at the opening of 2021. The Q4 2020 was amazing. And then from January, February, March, we have seen an increase month on month. In fact, between January and February, there was an increase of 14% in, uh, in transaction value and volume. So it's really has been amazing. Um, like I said, we have people come in, we have a lot of Europeans here. We started seeing a lot of Americans as well, uh, US passport holders. And, um, and I don't see it slowing down, to be honest. I think the opportunity is now or never. There you go. Well, I think the theme that I'm hearing he, uh, through the conversations that and what we've been sharing with everyone is the fact that, um, you know, real estate is forever. Um, it's, uh, you know, and, and we just have to understand. And I think the relevance of working with companies like Engel and Volkers and Berkshire Hathaway Home Services is that these are global companies that have boots in the ground. They have uh, amazing talent uh, that is advising their consumers at the local level because you do need, you know, and I think there is a big misconception of what does it mean to be a global real estate professional or advisor or whatever title you want to give yourself or, or developer for that matter, uh, you know, but it's truly having those networks and those relationships where a man can call us in New York City and say, hey, this is what, you know, we need uh, this type of asset or this, you know, what, whatever it is that is related to real estate, be it in the residential or commercial environment. And Nicole mentioned about her company brokering yachts and other services. You know, we have incredible partnerships being part of home, uh, Bersha Hathaway, of course, we own NetJets and we have special partnerships with NetJets for our clients and it's exclusive just to them. And a lot of people have resorted to private aviation during the pandemic. Be, and, and, and I think all these different aviation companies, I mean, if you look at the private sector or the, you know, um, of the aviation, it's booming. Uh, and if you speak to, you know, national airline or international airline companies, they have a, a different uh, narrative to give us. And again, everything is interconnected, right? Uh, that client that is buying, uh, I know in Dubai, they're, they're building uh, ports where you're going to have the opportunity to park your mega yacht somehow to get around. But, you know, that's why uh, Montenegro has done so well. I mean, to buy a yacht slip in Montenegro, you're talking about $30 million just for the slip to, to park it, you know? And um, I, I think is through these relationships and being able to communicate to each other. Like if I have a client coming from the Middle East to New York, I can call Dunia and say, this is the profile of my client. Uh, therefore, uh, what else can you give me that might be impacting his buying or selling process? Because there are a lot of investors in New York City currently that come from all over the world that are heavily invested in real estate in New York. And they're trying to determine as we speak, what do they do with those assets? Do they hold on to them? or do they dispose of them or when is the right time? So I think for us, we have that, um, you know, professional and moral obligation to be fully informed and, and, and help each other. And, you know, we're still in our emphasis stages of growth globally, as far as Berkshire Hathaway Home Services is concerned, I can reach out to Nikki and, you know, she can uh, refer someone to me in another market where I don't have an office yet, but just knowing her, I know that I'm going to be putting my client and trusting them with a valued and then respected uh, real estate professional in that marketplace. It's, I think what this all boils down to is that when you're working with this global citizen, you're looking at a holistic view of their real estate portfolio. It's not just where you physically are located, 
but you have to be able to give them advice and understand what's going on with all of their other assets. And often the only way to do that is really to have great professionals that you can pick up the phone or send a quick WhatsApp and say, explain to me how this works. What do I need to know? How do we work together to help our client get to where they need to be? Now, from the, um, the financial perspective, like for us, a lot of the drivers, even through the pandemic, because a lot of uh, our national companies, because a lot of consumers went out from urban communities into the suburbs, they have probably had the best years ever in history of selling real estate. And a lot of that was driven by um, by our interest rates being so low. I mean, to borrow money, um, it, it, it would still, even though there is a prediction that interest rates are going to go up, when you're going from a, a, such a low basis point, you know, adding another point or two points to an interest rate for somebody who's been in the business for 30 years and owned real estate for so long. You know, I grew up in the days, my first home, I think my interest rate was 17 or 18%. And when you tell a young person that that such thing existed, you know, when they hear 4%, 5%, they, they freak out. I'm like, you don't understand, child. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Know? So how is that, how is it for you in your markets in London or in, uh, uh, you know, Dubai? I mean, in London, oh. so, sorry, go ahead, can you ask you? It's all right, you can go ahead. <laughs> okay, I mean, yeah, for sure that it's had a massive impact. It's aided, uh, it's aided uh, the market activity massively. Uh, you know, the government here has gone above and beyond that as well. We've had... Um, they call it the stamp duty holiday. Holidays and paying additional taxes that would normally be applicable for your purchase and whatnot. Um, and those have been continually extended. Initially, I think they were due to uh, expire in March, and because our lockdown has just continued, they've extended that even further. And it's it's been a driver to help sustain the, prop, uh, the property market, and it is most definitely helped. Um, you know, I, I know firsthand many people have taken advantage of it, and it's been a primary prim primary driver for them to go ahead and action their transaction because of these holidays, because they do have a, a you know a massive um, impact in, in, in your final final um, amount. So yeah, the, the incentives have worked, you know, as much as sometimes they, they seem like they're just uh, propaganda from the government to, you know, say, talk like they're trying to help. They genuinely have in, in many cases. Great. Dunia? In Dubai, same thing. I mean, the mortgage uh, departments in every bank has really uh, scored high level of um, of providing mortgages during the Q4, uh, and the interests were very low. Um, there's one way. Since I've come to Dubai for the past 16 years, I've never seen really the interest very high. Like it was four, five percent, three point three nine nine. Even this for during this pandemic, we've seen 2.99%. Yes, it's not fixed for the entire uh, tenure, but at least as a starting point, it's very encouraging. Where we had to curb, um, use the, the mortgage uh, to curb inflation is when it, came, when it came to the LTV. So when I first came to Dubai, we had people able to achieve as high as, high as 100% LTV against the property they're buying. Right now, and just after the 2008, 2009, we had a quick change uh, to, to 80, 85. However, just when the recovery started, we again seen prices starting going, started going up, flipping of property started happening. So the LTV was set at 75% for the first property and 65% for your second property. So it was, uh, through the LTV that they could curb the inflation or control um, another mortgage disaster to hit uh, us here in Dubai or perhaps the world. But uh, yes, the low interest has really given a boost to the, per the home uh, purchase here in Dubai during the Q4, even uh, right now. Uh, but I think it has slightly slowed down because the prices of the homes have gone up and people are now contemplating that 30% that they have to um, pay, uh, it, it's no more what it used to be three months ago. So things are being reviewed. Good. And just to give the audience clarification, because I don't know who the audience is, not everybody might be, uh, understand the real estate lingo. LTV is loan to value. Uh, what yes. is the amount of money that you can borrow when you are purchasing a home? 
and uh, you know our first financial i mean our financial crisis of the 2008 in the united states was due to those uh, loan to value ratios that were they didn't exist and quite honestly <laughs> and a mm -hmm. lot of people uh, unfortunately um, were victims of not understanding the type of product that they were purchasing when they acquired their homes so i, I think every country has learned their lessons and uh, there is a lot more regulation and involvement in the process. But at the same token, I think there is a lot of wonderful programs that do exist. Uh, I know the focus here is on ultra high net worth um, clientele, but uh, yet again, as you say, Aman, when we start conversation, they are probably the most savvy and unshrewd business people, and they're not going to spend their own money uh, up front. They rather leverage their assets through other opportunities. So, uh, you know, part of our responsibility as well as real estate professionals is that, yes, we, we collectively put together a, a team of professionals to service our clients because we're not attorneys and we're not financial advisors but as nikki said we need to have that knowledge and skill set to be able to have the preliminary conversations and are be able to articulate the needs of that client because every country has different guidelines and regulations just on and, and more than anything else when a uh, high net worth individual is looking into uh, diversifying their portfolios with real estate, uh, the tax implications are probably the number one driver for those investments, whether it's personal or it is uh, on a uh, business level. So Nikki, anything else you want to add? You've been amazing to um, give us this no. opportunity to be an- No, no, no thanks. Nothing, nothing so far. This has been a great conversation. It's been very informative. So before we depart, we have about nine minutes left. Dunia, Aman, anything you want to share about your businesses, um, how we can support you from New York to London and uh, Dunia in Dubai and you know, again, we want to keep this conversation going. I am so grateful, Aman, that you agreed to join us today. Okay. And of course, uh, Dunia, and I know you have a tremendous busy schedule. Like you said, you have a large portfolio. But any parting words or uh, suggestions that you have for us, Aman, as real estate professionals to better continue to service people like yourself? Sure. And uh, I think it's uh, Prior to us is coming online, as I was mentioning to you before, you know, with, uh, with, the, with the current travel restrictions and whatnot, it's been very hard for us to man manage our projects and developments out in the US at the moment. So the support that we've had from Berkshire Hathaway has been amazing. Uh, you know, we've been trying to close a few last few developments off, and there we're at the final stage of the development, and you know, that's normally the point where myself, in my role specifically, I would be there ensuring that the property is to the utmost highest standard, ready for the market. And in my inability to be there, uh, Diane, who works with Berkshire Hathaway, has been absolutely amazing and, you know, just helped me tremendously. And we wouldn't have been able to get that project on the market if it wasn't for our assistance. So, you know, massive appreciation on that front. And Junia, you know, you're new to the brand. Uh, I feel older now that you are behind <laughs> you, like behind me. But how do you, you know, share with us how you have found the support that the network gives you for, um, you know, for your local market? And it, it ha with all honesty, it has been amazing. I mean, I prior to joining Berkshire Hathaway Home Services, I, I had my own company. Uh, local company here and when they approached me and I had the privilege to meet the CEO and the chairman and um, uh, luckily someone from the United States were here as well so I could see what our corporate uh, office uh, you know uh, would look like and who the people who are working there I really I was um, I was pleasantly surprised and in fact just the fact that Berkshire Hathaway Home Services as a brand has embarked on a journey in the Middle East, it gives us, it gives the Middle East and it gives Dubai 
market is a, a huge vote of confidence. So I was really thrilled. I was very happy. I was cheering at the back um, background. But then all of a sudden they contacted me and I became part of the family. I didn't hesitate. You know, I went through the facts. Of course, I, 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 I knew the brand doesn't need any... Uh, any uh, introduction but the people were amazing and further to that the people in the united states were amazing and we had a huge network i mean 1500 offices 55000 brokers what what else can you ask for and as you know ellie we're working on a huge uh, mandate right now out of dubai and uh, yes <laughs> and the first thing i did is to run to the network and ask for their help and assistance because i really we really Dubai is an international market and we have uh, our number one buyers are visitors and uh, expats so uh, they, no one hesitates no one even took a second to say oh yeah let me think no everybody was ready one of them is yourself Ellie and I'm very grateful for that and our London office our Marbella office our California, Nevada, Colorado everyone is on board and I'm very thrilled and happy that we all as a family uh, are going to be working on this and showing the world that we are truly a global uh, company. So yes, it has been a phenomenal uh, experience so far and I'm looking forward to the what's coming. Great. Well, Thank Nicole, the five minutes that are left belong to you. You have been such a gracious host and I can't thank you enough for inviting me to be part of this panel. And, and this has like, been tremendous. It's been really, really wonderful. And I think what's really great about this is that everything we're talking about is ultimately brand, it's, it's brand agnostic. And whether you are with Engel and Volkers or Berkshire Hathaway, any real estate professional really needs to build their team and they need to build their team of professionals. They need to build their team of other agents that they work with in other markets so that we can continue to service our clients at the highest and best level at all price points. So this has been really, really tremendous. And so many thanks to Anthony and the team at the New York City Real Estate Expo for giving us this opportunity to have this wonderful discussion from the comforts of home and to be a Zoom. I mean, this is amazing that we can be collaborating this way. If we were trying to do all of this in person, can you imagine? The amount uh, of know, hours we have to fly and- uh, I know, I know. And I, <laughs> I have that's to fly of, like- <laughs> But that's one of the gifts of this yeah. pandemic that we have been able to connect on a deeper level with so many people in so many different mm -hmm. parts of the world using our internet connections. This has been really, truly wonderful. And I'm glad to have been here with all of you and thank you to Anthony and the team. And we will wrap this up and to the people attending. Oh, here's Anthony, he's back. Uh, did someone mention my name? We <laughs> did. You must have been in the Imagine. back listening to us. Let's face it. Uh, you guys are great. You guys are really great. Actually, tomorrow, guys, we, we do have a big day tomorrow. Um, we are going to be talking about some networking, what we're doing, and there is one thing that we are doing at the NYC Real Estate Expo is putting together a global type of uh, speed networking, and especially even Ellie's going to be a presenter, as well as Nikki as well, on our global presentation markets. So we will be, and hopefully with Ellie's help and Nikki's help for the future, we will be putting more of these panels together, and hopefully on a bi-monthly basis. So I, I definitely want to thank you guys, really, Ellie, Nikki, Duna, and Amen. You guys are fantastic. It was really, like, like Nikki said, so informative. It was great to listen to you all, and it was an honor. And I want to really thank you for putting it together, guys. Um, I, again, tomorrow is going to be an interesting day. We, it's a full day. It's going to be a little bit different. It's like 30-minute presentations. And there's going to be so much out there available. You know, take a look at the NYC network groups backslash agenda, and you'll see all the little presentations for tomorrow. Today was mostly panels. Tomorrow's a little 30-minute presentations. Um, we will be sending out the video again, and uh, I am going to copy this chat thing and send it over to um, the girls, and they will get back to you. And once again, thank you, everybody. Thank you. This concludes Thanks. the webinar. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you, Anthony. You. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye, London. Bye-bye. Bye, London. Bye-bye, Dubai. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> I'll see you later on the block. <laughs> yes, I'll see you around the block. <laughs> well, I can't thank you enough, truly. Dunia, Aman. Um, thank you. You guys rock.
Thank, my pleasure. Thank you guys for the opportunity. It was lovely.